Hello everyone and welcome to the Fusion AP Talks, a student-led webinar on fusion science and technology. I'm your host, Dawal, and I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Mikola Yalovega, hailing from Ukraine. Mikola recently obtained his PhD from the Exmarsi University of France. Before his PhD, he was awarded the EACEA scholarship to pursue the Fusion EP Master in Science. He also holds a Master of Science in Physics, which he obtained from the Ukraine, uh, in the National University of Kharkiv with honors. Apart from his uh, command over physics, he also is fluent in English, Ukrainian and Russian, alongside more than enough proficiency in German. He's a very good communicator and his awards for best poster in CCFE Summer School of 2019 as well, as the presentation in conferences are a testament to it. He has several publications, including the field, uh, including also in the field of retention studies for plasma fishing components. Without further delay, I would like to thank everyone for zooming in today. I will now mute myself and hand it over to Mikola. Welcome everyone and enjoy the talk. Hello everybody. Uh, my name, thank you Dawal for introducing. My name is Mikola. And uh, today I will uh, talk about the effects of oxide play on tungsten retention study for the first of all materials. So in the future, we, want, uh, we plan to use fusion for the energy production and to achieve this uh, goal, we are constructing ITER tokamak, which aims to demonstrate scientific and technical feasibility of fusion. And the plasma that will be generated in the uh, vacuum vessel of the device uh, will allow endothermic reaction and uh, the ethereum and tritium ions will fuse together, producing helium and neutrons. And uh, this 80% uh, uh, of the reaction will be carried out by neutrons and 20% of the reaction will be carried out by uh, alpha particles. And uh, so, uh, and so uh, let's look into the device closer. And uh, the plasma will be generated in the vacuum vessel and due to the um, physical phenomena, particles will uh, escape uh, the confined region of uh, of plasma and uh, follow the separatrix line go down to the delta region. And so what is delta? Delta is a uh, bottom part of the machine uh, and it will be exposed uh, to the expensive fluxes of particles, which are ethereum, tritium, helium, neutron and impurities also. And so uh, it is a uh, plan that ether will achieve a fusion power amplification factor of 10. And so we expect uh, quite uh, uh, strong heat flux uh, to the diverter region of about 10 uh, megawatts per square meter. And uh, there will be a significant flux of particles, 10 to 24 particles per meter square per second. And the energy of these particles will be below 100 electron volts. And the surface temperature of the uh, plasma facing material uh, will be uh, elevated, will be above 1000 Kelvin. And also, it's, this temperature is uh, uh, during the discharges. However, in between the discharges, the temperature will uh, drop because of uh, cooling of the components. Uh, and so uh, we will have effect of thermal cycling, just something to consider, to remember. And that's why we need to uh, select such materials that will uh, sustain all these heat and particle fluxes. And this uh, choice of the material is justified by the high melting point, thermal conductivity, electric conductivity, resistance to sputtering, and low hydrogen retention. And uh, especially comparing to the previously used uh, carbon plasma facing materials, and uh, so far, uh, tungsten is the most promising material for the plasma facing uh, components for fusion machines. And so it has been chosen for it, especially because of the high uh, melting point. And uh, yes, and let's look now uh, closer into the particle fluxes into the Delta region. And uh, we will have uh, deuterium, tritium and the thing is that a fraction of these particles will be retained in the plasma facing materials. There is also impact of helium and uh, it's uh, important to consider because uh, helium may create uh, some uh, structures that are called 
helium bubbles and this may modify the properties of the material and this we also study in our work but i will not uh, tell this today maybe in the future talks uh, there will be also impact on the component uh, by the neutrons and impurities and today we will focus actually on the oxygen what uh, has oxygen to do with tungsten and uh, you know the thing is that tungsten has high uh, has uh, quite a strong affinity with oxygen and so uh, this results in the formation of uh, native tungsten oxide on the surfaces and uh, what is native tungsten oxide it's a very very thin uh, layer of the oxides for example it's a uh, few nanometers thick on it and uh, so when we will um, introduce the plasma facing components with tungsten uh, as a plasma facing material in the ether they will have this native tungsten oxide on the surface but also uh, important thing is impact of the uh, high temperature of the plasma facing material during the discharges which may result in the modification of the native tungsten oxide or even into the growth of a thick oxide layer this can happen also in the case of uh, because of the presence of oxygen uh, water so impurities but also uh, this can happen in case of an accident uh, when um, the internal pressure um, will increase for example during air or water leak and uh, also these oxide layers might be modified due to this thermal cycling you remember that the component uh, will uh, have a high uh, surface temperature during the discharge and then uh, it will be cooled down so this can have some impact on the modification of the oxide layers on tungsten and all together so the presence of the oxide layer and its modification uh, may change retention physical properties of the plasma facing material and this is important to account because tritium is radioactive so it imposes safety uh, limits and also we want to have correct performance of the plasma facing component uh, just as uh, as design and so this is the motivation uh, for uh, for this talk for the study in generally what we do we want to understand the fundamental mechanisms of hydrogen isotopes retention in um, tungsten plasma facing material these uh, different uh, surface um condition thin oxide uh, layer native tungsten oxide or thick oxide layer uh, which we uh, grow in our labs so at first i want uh, i want to introduce you how to plan an experimental campaign to study hydrogen isotopes retention this is i think important uh, to 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 explain especially for master students and in generally the way we think about experiments and then i will tell about high temperature oxidation of tungsten about uh, experiments with deuterium well uh, simple experiments with deuterium they're not that simple you will see uh, and then we will switch into um, experiments using a tritium and uh, in the end i will uh, summarize and give conclusions and perspectives so uh, what is the method uh, we use at first when we receive pristine uh, samples pristine tungsten samples we want to characterize them we want uh, to prepare them so this preparation step uh, involves uh, for example uh, mechanical or electrochemical polishing annealing and then the samples are characterized uh, to see the surface and bulk conditions of the samples it's very important for the retention study and then um, we modify the samples by uh, oxidizing them then the samples are characterized again because we have modified them so we need to understand what's uh, now different how thick is oxide and what is the surface condition and so on and uh, then we perform hydrogen isotopes implantation or loading and then there are many ways how you can uh, understand uh, the trapping uh, inside uh, the material and what we use is is a is a is a thermal desorption or thermal desorption experiments and sometimes this cycle can be repeated many times uh, to see the effect of the temperature and so after uh, this uh, is a thermal desorption thermal desorption we characterize the samples again and perform 
uh, implantation, TDS again, and so on. So uh, this is the way uh, we think about the experiment. And when I tell you characterization, what does it actually mean to characterize the samples? There are a variety of techniques one can use. And uh, the, the main uh, ones uh, uh, for the characterization of oxides is to observe the surface morphology using confocal laser scanning microscopy. Uh, this technique allows to study the roughness, for example, of the samples. Uh, it works on a micrometer scale, so it's a large uh, scale which you can see. And then you can zoom so uh, to see on a nanometer scale, uh, what, uh, what is the surface condition using scanning electron microscopy. And you also uh, can understand, uh, is there any effect of the grain orientation on oxidation of uh, tungsten uh, to, to see the effect of the grain orientation, you need to know what is the orientation of your grains, for example, uh, by using uh, electron uh, backscatter diffraction. And, uh, this is an example uh, here, different colors uh, denote, uh, sh show you uh, the different orientation of uh, each uh, grain on the polycrystalline tungsten sample. And also you need to know the near surface morphology of the samples. To see that, we cut the samples using focused iron beam technique. So in this way, uh, you uh, make a very thin uh, lamella this is an example of such lamella. And the top layer is so thin that it's transparent to electrons. And this uh, top layer here is observed using transmission electron microscopy technique. And so uh, you are able to access the near surface morphology of uh, the sample. And uh, then uh, we also study composition and crystalline structure of, uh, of the uh, samples. Uh, we used Raman and XPS techniques for that x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. Okay, so now uh, I will tell you about the high temperature oxidation of tungsten. And the idea is the following. So we wanted uh, to create an oxide layer that uh, may uh, grow uh, in, in what we call it relevant conditions. Of course, we are not able to mimic all conditions uh, in ITER. We don't have ITER yet. But we can at least try to be close uh, to, uh, to, to them. And uh, to oxidize uh, tungsten samples, we, uh, we, uh, we work at high surface temperature, so about 1000 Kelvin. We decided uh, to restrict ourselves, uh, to, restrict ourselves uh, to 1073 Kelvin and low oxygen pressure. That is important, of course. And so uh, PIM laboratory, in the ex Marseille University uh, has a lot of experience uh, of oxidizing uh, samples and characterizing them based on the previous work by uh, Younes Adab. And they, uh, however, um, in his work, uh, they were uh, performing oxidation at a much lower temperature. So we had to adapt a lot of uh, things to uh, to create a protocol which will allow reproducibility of the oxide uh, and to be able to control the thickness and to have a thermal stable oxide. This is important for uh, thermal desorption experiments when we heat the sample and we don't modify uh, the oxide just by heating. It's, uh, it's uh, really important to consider. So in our experiments, uh, I show you just a few examples, okay? Uh, we tested a um, range of pressures by uh, fixing the temperature at 1073 Kelvin. And what you can see, this is the Raman spectra of the oxides growing at high and low oxygen pressure. So at high pressure, you can see these two peaks here. And these peaks are um, characteristic for WO3 oxide. So it's W3 oxide, almost ideal, uh, which grows at high oxygen pressure. However, when you go uh, to the lower uh, oxygen pressure by uh, two orders of magnitude lower, uh, you still have a signature of uh, the peaks, 
but they are now much uh, wider. And this is because this oxide structure is disordered, locally disordered WO3. Sometimes we have additional peaks uh, rising, which tell us that there might be uh, that there is a mix of WO3 and WO2 in some cases. Uh, and this oxide, uh, uh, which is uh, locally disordered WO3, uh, maybe it's not it is not perfect, but we decided to stay at uh, to work with this oxide because it's uh, closer to uh, to irrelevant conditions because of lower um, oxygen pressure. This image here is the surface of the oxide, which you can see using uh, confocal microscope. You can see that oxide has different grains, which are characterized by different color. The color is due to the interference effect. And uh, what is nice about the confocal technique that uh, you can uh, you can not only uh, see uh, the grains and the color, you can also uh, measure the roughness of uh, each uh, grain, and you can also link uh, the confocal observations with uh, scanning electron microscopy observations, because with SEM you can zoom on each of the grains, yes, and you can also link uh, the Raman spectra that you measure on each of the grains, so it's a very nice technique to link uh, many other uh, observations and uh, to really know what happens to each specific grain at each step of the experimental campaign. And an interesting thing is that uh, these uh, oxides oxidized, uh, grown at a uh, high surface temperature, are uh, thermally stable, so uh, they uh, don't change their structure upon heating up to the temperature of oxidation. And uh, when we zoom uh, I, I, I mean, when we look at the surface on a um, nanometer scale, uh, we see the following picture. This is SEM image of the surface of the oxide. You can see that oxide is grown as uh, nanowires. The scale is here. Uh, you see it's micrometer and we have this uh, wire growth. And uh, this, uh, same, this very similar image is, was obtained after heating of this oxide. So the temperature effect doesn't play a significant role. It doesn't change the surface condition of the sample. And uh, this image shows you the cross-section of U of tungsten oxide. In this image, we are able to uh, see what is the thickness of the layer we have grown. And this here whiter part is WO3 actually. This topper, the top part is platinum. It's just a protection layer to protect during focused ion beam cut. Okay, and then the substrate here is tungsten. And what we learned from this uh, TEM image, transmission electron microscopy image, that oxide grows as crystals and uh, that there is a columnar growth of the oxide. With SEM, we see the wires, and uh, with uh, TEM, we see this columnar structure. And uh, when we take a um, uh, uh, diffraction pattern of the oxide crystal, you see that there are spots here and spots and uh, lines. And this tells you about uh, the, um, that oxide is crystal. However, you see that these spots are diffuse, diffusive a bit. And this is because oxide is locally disordered. So that's the information we learn from uh, this analysis. So this is the way we characterize the sample. So now we know how oxide looks like, what is its uh, structure, surface condition, bulk condition, and now we can go into the uh, retention study, right? So uh, we start with uh, deuterium, and there are uh, many uh, options you can select how to implant a deuterium uh, in the sample. You can do plasma exposure, use iron guns, or uh, use gas loading of the samples. And then after you perform the retention study, in our case, we use iron gun uh, to, uh, to implant a deuterium in the sample. And uh, then uh, to study the retention, uh, we use thermodesorption spectrometry, TDS technique. So imagine that we have implanted uh, 
tungsten or tungsten oxide sample uh, with the ethereum and then you heat the sample with a controlled uh, heating ramp in our case it's one kelvin per second in this way uh, you uh, will have desorption of uh, the ethereum species from the sample which are collected by quadruple mass spectrometer and by uh, knowing uh, the correction um, correction uh, sensitivity factor for for each uh, of the species you can sum up their signals and build the following plot the ethereum desorption rate versus the temperature so in this uh, plot, as an example, I show you two uh, peaks. Each peak uh, might be attributed to different uh, type of trap present in the material. So uh, there is um, temperature position and, uh, and intensity. And by uh, using some modeling uh, codes, for example, memes, steam, and there are many other codes, uh, you can attribute uh, the temperature position to the energy of specific traps and uh, also uh, by integral of uh, integrating uh, each peak you can um, estimate uh, the density of traps and when you take the integral of the whole spectra here you will um, know the total number of the source species if you have dissolved all the ethereum from your uh, sample then it is called retention but this has to be cross-checked with another independent measurement that there is no deuterium left in the sample after uh, the TDS. Okay, so we, at first we start impl implanting deuterium ions with the energy of 250 electron volt at room temperature. And we started uh, using uh, low uh, fl incident fluence of deuterium, just 2.8, 10 to 19 deuterium per square meter. And uh, what is the spectra that we see? This is the TDS spectra from our oxide, oxidized tungsten sample. You see that there are two uh, peaks here. And uh, without removing this uh, sample from the uh, implantation and TDS setup, we perform all experiments in situ in the same setup. Uh, we continue again, we implant and to do TDS. And the next spectra, we see some change occurs. Very interesting. And then we again implant and do TDS. And again, there is some change. So why do we have this change? One, only one of uh, possible explanation could be is due to the surface impurities that are present on the, on the surface of the sample and uh, such such impurities, for example, as water molecules. And with every next implantation and uh, thermodesorption cycle, so by implanting the ethereum and heating the sample, we uh, clean the surface of the sample. And so the ethereum uptake is different. And so the release is different. And at some point when there is no more surface impurities and the response of the top layer of the oxide uh, is, uh, uh, very similar at some point, we obtain a stable deuterium TDS uh, spectra from our sample. This is interesting result. You, I show it here. You see that uh, there are uh, this green uh, spectra uh, and uh, the, it doesn't change significantly anymore. So all we rep uh, repeat many times and we obtain very similar spectra all the time. And so by averaging this uh, spectra, uh, we say that, okay, this is now uh, data from replicate measurements and the error bars as in standard deviation. And uh, the oxide is stable oxide because of the stable uh, TDS release, reproducibility of TDS experiments. But sometimes one can face uh, an unexpected problem in the experiment. In our case, it was a small contribution from a molybdenum mask. Uh, this is because uh, a part of the ethereum was uh, implanted into the molybdenum mask holding the sample. So this is uh, the molybdenum part. Uh, you see the screws and the sample holder, always molybdenum. And here is uh, the sample there. And this is a uh, beam. 
uh, the, uh, the Ethereum ion beam. And the part of uh, the Ethereum was implanted here. So it's important to subtract uh, the signal from molybdenum and to obtain only uh, the signal from uh, of the Ethereum release from the oxide. That was done, and uh, later I will show you uh, this uh, spectra of the Ethereum release from the oxide. I will not tell you uh, all uh, about all the experiments we conducted, just to give you a flavor what uh, happens in case of isothermal desorption. So what does it mean? It's after implantation, we keep the sample in the ultra high vacuum condition at room temperature and for a defined time, and then you perform TDS. And so you vary this time uh, at which the sample is kept in the vacuum. And what we measure is this, you see that with increasing the storage time, so the time we keep the sample in the vacuum, we decrease the intensity and so the retention of the, uh, of the Ethereum in the uh, oxide. So uh, with, uh, with increasing storage time, less uh, the Ethereum remains in the sample. And this is interesting in fact, because you know, uh, we have released at room temperature, which indicates that there are trapping sites with low energy. And this is important to consider for ITER because we will have some fuel recycling from this kind of oxide, uh, if, if we will have them, of course. Uh, and uh, this may have an impact on the edge plasma. So something to keep in mind. And now we will integrate these peaks here and build this plot. So this is the Ethereum release versus the storage time. And you can see that we can uh, fit this um, data with uh, exponential decay function uh, and uh, the decay time will be 190 hours, uh, around 190 hours. And this uh, means that the, the Ethereum release is quite, is quite slow at room temperature. For example, when we compare um, with the case of uh, the term release from a polycrystalline tungsten without this thick oxide layer, it's only 19 hours. So the decay time is much shorter. And then uh, what one can do with this kind of information? Well, you can consider a different uh, detrapping, uh, different uh, desorption uh, kinetics. So if we consider first order desorption kinetics, in this case, uh, the main uh, rate limiting step is actually detrapping. So uh, the traps are the main, uh, the main thing. And by considering uh, this uh, first order desorption kinetics, uh, which is described by this uh, equation here, where desorption is proportional to the uh, exponent where you have the uh, detrap energy, oi, sorry, uh, where you have the detrap energy, you can recalculate this detrap energy and the mean detrap energy for uh, our sample is about 1.16 electron volts. Yeah, when we compare this uh, polycrystalline tungsten, pristine without thick oxide layer on the surface, it's only 1.1 electron volt. So there is a difference, clear difference between these um, two cases. But something to uh, to think about is when you perform the ion implantation, you may modify your oxide layer. This is because of sputtering, right? So imagine when we implant the ethereum ions, we sputter away some uh, oxygen. And so we create a new near surface layer, which has much less oxygen content due to the preferential sputtering of oxygen by 250 EV the ethereum ions. And this layer might have even uh, just uh, be left with tungsten. It only depends on the fluence, right? So it's uh, very, uh, it means that by implanting the ethereum ions, we modify the layer. Uh, and also one has to keep in mind that sputtering is a complex process. It's not only physical sputtering, it's also chemical erosion of oxygen. So there are a lot of uh, processes uh, that, uh, that occur in this uh, oxide uh, structure when we implant uh, hydrogen uh, isotopes. And uh, what could be another option uh, to modify less the, the, the oxide is to use gas implantation. And in our case, we use tritium for that. So 
we use tritium gas uh, loading uh, technique. This is a good technique in terms of it's a gentle technique comparing with ion implantation because you don't have uh, this um, physical sputtering. It's uh, very sensitive uh, because of uh, radioactivity. You can use liquid scintillation uh, counting uh, to count the desorption of tritium. And it's, of course, closer to in situ conditions of theater because you have uh, tritium, right? And the, the problem is that tritium is radioactive. radioactive. And uh, so there is much more responsibility because when you work with tritium, uh, or you need to take a lot of things into account. There are always two people present in the uh, tritium lab where you do experiments. One is always uh, checking what is uh, doing the other person. Uh, and uh, you have uh, not a lot of uh, flexibility uh, because if you, you cannot use the same sample uh, several times, uh, you cannot remove it uh, from the uh, tritium uh, laboratory when you introduce something, when you put something into the glow box, that's where we work. Uh, you cannot uh, take it out anymore. So it's uh, much more uh, complex and a uh, lot of responsibility that you need to think. And that's why training requires some time. And uh, the manipulations, as uh, you have uh, the feeling now, is very complex. And uh, this is an example of the glow box uh, which we used. You see these gloves, and uh, you uh, put hands inside and you manipulate there. And uh, it's, of course, it's very complex because uh, uh, even an easy manipulation that you uh, do uh, uh, with deuterium, you, you take it with your hand, uh, the sample put in the device. Here it's much more complex. You have the gloves. And so you need to take into account. This is an uh, example. Uh, this is a sketch of the uh, device that we use. You have these uh, pipes. And of course, the volumes of the pipes has to be minimized because you want a very little quantity of tritium uh, that is introduced into the setup. And tritium is retained in one of the ovens here. It can be released. And uh, here is a flask connector to connect the samples. So the samples are usually put in the glass. And it's easy to uh, handle uh, with the glass. There, there are usually two samples in one uh, vial. Uh, these samples are separated by a small uh, glass here. And there is a thinner part here, which you can heat and melt the glass. And so you can separate uh, the samples from the rest of the device. And uh, so when the samples are connected here, they can be loaded. Uh, they, they, the gas, tritium gas can be introduced. And then uh, you close, separate the samples, and melt the glass, and take only this small vial and everything else uh, uh, all the rest uh, of tritium in the setup can be reabsorbed uh, uh, by the uh, by the ovens. Some part, of course, will be still released into the atmosphere if you have uh, after um, you have agreement from a responsible person that uh, checks everything. So uh, you see, it's uh, it's a really complex experiment. I should I, sh I should say. And uh, so when uh, the samples uh, with uh, tritium gas inside to uh, induce tritium migration into the sample, you need to heat. So the samples are heated in the oven and then uh, they are put in, in liquid nitrogen to freeze uh, the diffusion. And uh, then you start a uh, room temperature desorption experiment by breaking this glass, separating the two samples into different glass containers. And these glass containers are connected with a bubbling machine. So all the dissolved uh, tritium species going through the pipes into these bubbling machines, they are accumulated in the sampling bottles. And we take uh, samples from these bottles um, to uh, analyze uh, what uh, is the amount of tritium released during the experiment. So that's how it all is done. And I want to show you the uh, results we have uh, for the room temperature release of tritium from the tungsten oxide. 
and you can see uh, that uh, about uh, that we also have release at room temperature on the time scale of a month so uh, it's uh, it's interesting because it's again an indication of trapping sites with low energy and uh, about 75 percent of tritium is dissolved within 30 days which is a quite significant amount and by fitting this spectra in the same way as we just did uh, for uh, uh, the ethereum we can also estimate the main uh, the mean detrapping energy and it's about 1.13 eV and it can be uh, compared with the results of the TDS experiments using the ethereum ion implantation let's recall that in that case we had the trap energy of one electron volts and so there is a slight difference uh, between these two values which is probably because in the case of uh, ion implantation uh, using the ethereum we have modified the top layer of the oxide and this top layer might have a stronger uh, trapping sites than uh, when uh, tritium is introduced in the uh, samples with gas loading so that's the difference here and so i want now to conclude and give some perspectives so uh, the things i want you to remember uh, of, uh, from my talk is that tungsten can easily oxidize and this may lead to the modification of plasma facing material retention and also other properties and the tungsten oxide grown at a high temperature above 1000 kelvin is thermally stable just by heating the samples it's very difficult uh, to uh, it's, it's not possible to modify it if you heat uh, just to the temperature of oxidation and the uh, initial surface condition influence the ethereum uh, and tritium uptake and release just as we see when we implant uh, the ethereum in the sample that is uh, as introduced from the air into vacuum and you start implantation you have a modification of the ethereum release uh, and uptake uh, because of surface impurities uh, and also there is significant and long term on the scale of a month release of hydrogen isotopes at room temperature because of low detrapping energy of the traps which we uh, show with deuterium ion implantation also tritium gas loading and isothermal desorption experiments and uh, there are a lot of questions you that uh, have still to be answered you see uh, we have conducted a lot of experiments but uh, it's never enough and uh, there are many questions uh, what about uh, sputtering physical and uh, chemical erosion of oxygen what is the migration depth of the ethereum and tritium inside the oxide and also interesting question is creation of tungsten bronze uh, because when uh, tungsten oxide is intercalated with um, deuterium or tritium, it uh, you can create a new uh, compound which is tungsten bronze, and this uh, has another properties. Uh, so everything there is still so much to study, and uh, yes, I I I will be glad. Uh, to, to hear your questions and uh, to hear if somebody uh, uh, does a similar work and what are your results, guys. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mikola. That was indeed a very enlightening talk. Uh, we now uh, will take questions uh, from the audience. While we wait for some questions, uh, I will have a question of my own, if I could. Nicola, um, these studies that you that you did, mm -hmm. um, what what should be the what should be the follow up for uh, for a person, let's say, on a master level? Like, so this was your PhD work, as I understand, right? So it's a very if, small part of my PhD work. <laughs> yes, 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 I understand. So what 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 would be what would be uh, an ideal follow up for you? How would you want to continue on this work? Yeah, so in fact, uh, we are continuing this work uh, that I have done. Uh, 
uh, and there is a, a student or there will be a student in our lab at PIM laboratory in Marseille that uh, and the student will continue this work. The things that uh, I yeah. I think could be done on the on the level of a master student is uh, to study migration. It's a very important question for modeling teams. You know, we uh, we have collected a lot of data for the Ethereum and Tatium release from the site. Also, um, for the case of the Ethereum, I didn't show here, but we have a lot of data for the fluence dependency when we implant different fluence and so on. What, what does it change? But the things that uh, one has to study is uh, migration. How deep and uh, can the Ethereum uh, penetrate in the oxide layer? Uh, because uh, using this information, we will be able to uh, model the results and to build a theoretical model for the Ethereum or Tritium trapping in the oxide. This is the main thing uh, that I, I, pers I personally think it's very important and it can be done uh, by master student. Uh, there, is, there are labs in, uh, in, uh, in Gushing that uh, have capability, for example, to measure migration. All right, thank you very much.